It is now the fifth session under the title of Sustainable Business as the Rule to End Water Poverty. And we will uh, have uh, Sunil uh, Lalvani, the founder of Project Magi, to tell us about uh, the uh, resolution of the water crisis and how this contributes to solving educational problems, healthcare, and uh, other uh, issues. Good afternoon. So I'd like you to imagine a world where there are 800 million people who don't have access to clean water. Those people often have to walk many, many miles to get access to clean water. And often when they reach that source, it's a dirty, filthy, unhygienic source of water, often shared with animals. And now imagine a world where every community in the world has local access to clean water right in the heart of their village. Where waterborne disease is a thing of the past. Where women and girls no longer have to go through the back-breaking task of carrying water for miles. Where children and young girls can go back to school or just have time to play. And when the older ones actually have time to work or just be at home and be full-time mums. Imagine that world where every community in the world has a local source of access to water right in the heart of their village. And that's a world I'd like to see. And I believe that we can achieve. So my story starts after working 20 years in my family's electronics business. That took me across the African continent. And one fateful day in 2014, I was in Ghana driving across country on a bush road when my driver abruptly stopped. So I asked him, what's going on? And he said, I can't drive any further because there's a puddle of water in the road. So we're in a four by four. I said, well, what's the problem? Just drive through the water. And he said, I can't because there's two kids in the water. And this certainly drew my attention. So I asked him, what are the kids doing in the water? I remember very vividly that he said to me in such a nonchalant way, yeah, they're collecting their water for the day, and then they'll move on, and then I can drive through. Now, he was a Ghanaian guy, so this was obviously quite normal to him. But to me, with a Western upbringing, this was really quite shocking. So I got down from the car. I spoke to these kids and wanted to understand more about what was going on, and found that they lived about 100 meters up this hill. And sure enough, they were on their way to do their one-hour walk to collect water. And they said, luckily, luckily, it rained last night, and this puddle of water was there to avoid a long walk. And I just found that shocking, that anybody might consider that source of water as lucky. So I actually walked up to the village with them. I met the elders. I spoke to the chief. And sure enough found that the village had been given a hand pump. An NGO had come in a few years earlier and installed this facility. But then I found, just a few months later, it had broken down. And nobody knew about it outside the village. There were no funds to fix this. And so the hand pump wasn't working. So now can you imagine that? Living in a village in water poverty. And then being given the gift of clean water to serve you every day and then having that snatched away from you. And then you have to go back to those long walks to filthy, unhygienic, dangerous sources of water and live that abhorrent life again. And that's what caused me to start Project Maji. Maji meaning water in Swahili. Using two decades of business experience, I wanted to find a way that we could bring an end to this water poverty. 
but using a business mentality. I wanted to make sure that if we did this, every community that we addressed was going to be served not only for the short term, but for the long term. I wanted to make sure that any water we gave to a village was going to last for years and years to come. We did not want to repeat the problems of the hand pump, and that's where we started. So we looked at this technology that had been around for many years, and I'm a big believer that disruption in an industry comes from the outside. So I had very little experience in water. I had no experience in the fourth sector. So I think I could come at this with a really fresh mindset. The first thing we had to do was look at technological innovation in the product. We had to stop this incessant pumping and physical effort by young ladies and women um, and make it a lot easier for them. You'll also notice that the hand pump has a single tap, a single spout. And that means often in the morning hours when there's a rush hour, there can be a line for as, lo as long as one or two hours to collect the water. So we had to get rid of the physical effort and the long queues that were part and parcel of the hand pump solution. But we also had to come up with an operational innovation. Because to avoid these things sitting there like white elephants uh, across the continent, and some of the statistics will tell you that as many as 70% of hand pumps installed on the continent are lying there dysfunctional, we had to come up with a sustainable business model that was going give to us, give us a viable business to let the water pumps be run, our water pumps be run and maintained and sustained over a long period of time. So we built our first site. You can see it's run by solar panels. So we took away all the manual effort of the hand pump. We also could avoid any running costs from this. We didn't have to rely on unreliable or inconsistent or expensive grid power from the, from, from the, com from the country. We pumped the water and sorted it into a 5,000 litre water tank. And we provided nine taps around the side so we could get rid of those long waits in the early morning. We could see after we installed and ran this that it was an overwhelming success. We could see that the impact was immediate and obvious. So after completing this first pilot, we decided we're going to set ourselves a target to reach 1 million people by the year 2025. But in doing this, we wanted to focus on the smaller communities those villages of about 1,000 people or less, because we felt those were the most disenfranchised and the ones that were typically being left behind. Now, in order to reach this scale, we knew we had to standardize our product. We weren't going to be able to roll this out across many, 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 many villages if we had to bespoke every solution. So we developed the Project Margie Cube which is essentially a flat-packed kiosk that can be delivered quite easily to the most remote villages. Much like IKEA furniture, it can be assembled in just a few hours uh, by some simply trained technicians. And by standardizing the solution, we were able to build in the robust reliability of these units that were so central to our business mission. And being this efficient has allowed us so far to deploy in over 50 villages water facilities that cost as little as $10 per person. And thinking about the operational side of things, we're able to provide water at a cost of less than 0.1 cent per liter. Now, for all the work that we do in deploying these sites, and however cost efficient we can be, none of it makes any sense or is worthwhile unless we can ensure that every single dollar deployed is making a significant positive social impact. We want to make sure that we have healthy communities, that women can work, be teachers, and teach in schools so the kids can learn. So to make sure this happens, we've worked with the London Business School and the University of Cape Coast in Ghana, who independently measure and quantify the impact we're making. And this is some of the work that we do. As first, we have some dam 
in the down year. You will use that one to bath at times, roughly two, three months, I will fall sick. I will go to hospital so I can never go to work, about two, three days. At times, 150 Ghana. Now when we get this clean water, that amount will be doing something for me. So I'm happy. Since we got this clean water, it helped me a lot. It let me feel comfortable. I feel happy. In my view, if you people will help us to get one of the clean water attached, I think it will help people in the town a lot. So then we make the impact that we desi desire to make, but we have to make sure that as we grow, we're going to be sustainable at scale. We have to be technically sustainable and financially sustainable. On the technical front, we have an excellent team of well-trained engineers who are ready to go out at any time, not only to build our facilities, but in the very unlikely event that something goes wrong, they can go out and fix them promptly. And to make sure they're as efficient as possible, we have installed mobile monitoring on every one of our sites so that they can see, sitting in their office remotely on a live basis, how every site is performing. They can see the solar power that's coming in, how much water is pumped, and just simply if a site is working or not. So if they need to go out, they can go out. This enables us to keep our costs of operation at a minimal level, but also ensure that we provide a maximum uptime of water delivery to all the communities that we serve. And to be financially sustainable, we have to make sure we get our planning right. So before we go into any, any geography, we work with the local government assembly. We talk to them, we get their buy-in for what we're going to do, and we explain to them that we want to be a service provider for water on a chargeable basis. They then help us select the individual communities within their district. And then very key is we go and talk to the village people themselves. We have a community gathering within the village before we come and install a site. We explain our principles. We explain our methodology. We explain that we're going to be there for the long term to provide sustainable water. And then we have a discussion with them about what they are willing to pay for the water. We never go in without having their sign off and their decision on what the pricing should be. Because charging for water provides two key principles. One, first of all, they attach a value to the product that we are serving. They take some ownership and some responsibility of the kiosk once they know it's something that they are paying for. And secondly, to avoid the problems that we've seen with hand pumps, we want to make sure that we have an ongoing revenue stream so that we have the funds available that should something go wrong, our team can go in and fix it on a long-term and sustainable basis. Now, with all the funds that we are collecting, as we have to go across country and across the continent, indeed, we want to make sure that we can collect this money efficiently. So we've installed and, well, we've developed and then installed a cashless mobile automated payment system. These control the taps. They're used with plastic pay-as-you-go tokens and make sure that all the money is always accounted for and properly audited. This is how it works. However much water is collected, that money is deducted from the token and it only pours as long as the token is on the site. And the water will stop. And these are very much the smiles that we try to work for as well. So we've been operating for about five years now. We've gained a lot of experience on the way. We've had to fine tune and change our methodologies along the way. 
But we have absolutely positively seen that we can address the water crisis with a business mindset. We work with a number of partners who help us build out our infrastructure so that we can then focus on the consistent and sustainable uh, monitoring and maintenance of every site. We are not reliant on charitable donations that may or may not come. Very importantly, we have proven that the water crisis can be addressed without a complete reliance on philanthropy. While well-meaning, it's very hard to predict and very hard to plan for. So by positioning ourselves as a social enterprise, we've been able to talk to impact investors, we've been able to talk to uh, corporate sponsors who are able to work with us and can provide us with the quantum of funds that we need to reach the exponential growth that we target and that this cause so badly needs. But we're also not alone in this. There are a number of other safe water enterprises operating across the globe. We try and talk to them, meet, collaborate with them. We share best practices, we share technologies. And together, we think with this business approach, we are really starting to make a significant dent in the water crisis. Some of these companies are working in countries as Cambodia, Haiti, Bangladesh, India, Madagascar, and of course ourselves in sub-Saharan Africa. And there are a number of more excellent enterprises like this. But together we have seen that using this business mindset, we are able to make a, a, real, a real significant amount of progress in providing universal access to water and going a long way to achieving SDG goal six. And for me personally, after my venture started five years ago, this approach has helped me really to start to see the early lights of tackling this water crisis, where we're giving people more dignified lives, sanitary lives. Women can be home, be empowered, they can work, they can be with their children. Kids can go to school and learn and have a much, much brighter future. And of course, we hope that we can bring an end to people who are constantly searching for that, for that lucky puddle of water.
So thank you very much. Are there any Thank you for the presentation. I think it's um, a really good problem to solve. As um, you know, they say the, the wars of the future is going to be um, for water as opposed to energy. Um, and my question is revolving around um, the, the technology. So is, it, uh, on, is the tank on top of an existing well? So, so there, there are two ways we do this. Sometimes we drill a fresh well depending on the locations we are. We'll drill a fresh well, and then the, 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 the well is actually just to the side of the unit, because if you have to access the well, we can't move the whole unit just to the side of it. But actually, very often, and our preferred method of action is actually to go in where there's a broken hand pump, mm -hmm. remove the broken hand pump, and use the existing bore well that is there. A borehole can cost four or $5,000 to drill. Okay. So we'd rather not spend that money on new boreholes when they're perfectly good ones. So uh, you're using the solar panels in, in order to extract the, the water? That's right. right. The solar panel pumps up the water, stores it into a tank, 5,000 liters a day. Um, mm -hmm. So there's ample for the community to be, to be served uh, for, on a 24-hour cycle. So in the days where, let's say, there's no sun or it's really cloudy or something, um, you have the, uh, the tank as a sort of reserve. Exactly right, yes. yes. Okay. So in, in, in general, the village we serve, they probably need two to 3,000 a day, liters. Okay. But we deliver 5,000. On a very sunny day, we can produce more as well. But exactly right, that acts as our buffer storage tank. All right, I think that's, that's amazing. I'm just wondering, is there, is there like a possible way to um, uh, you know, funnel water if it's raining from on top and then um, I, the, the, it's a good question. There is a way, and we're exploring this. The challenge is, is, the, is the purity of the water. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that our water from source is clean and, and potable to WHO standards of drinking. If we capture rainwater and mix it, there's a risk that the water might get polluted. But we're, ex we're constantly exploring mm -hmm. uh, different ways of filtration and managing yeah, things Yeah, like that's this. what I was, my next point. If there's like a layer of filter, maybe that would... Uh... We, so at the moment, we just make sure that our water is pure from source because adding filtration adds an additional co cost and complexity. But we're working on that as the next stage in our, in our project. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, so um, again, of course, this is an amazing initiative. It's great to see the change happening to such communities that have such uh, critical issues. Um, my question here is, so the water source that uh, we're relying on in these projects is groundwater, correct? That's right, that's right. And then the second question is, is, the, is it sustainable given the recharge rate and the extract, extraction rate? So is this something that they can do for years or do we need to find other sources in the future? Okay, thank you, good, good question. So every community we go into, we do a full hydro, hydrogeological survey um, and we pump out one days of water and we watch it recharge and we make sure that the refresh rate is always sufficient. Actually, 5,000 liters a day is not that much when you consider what's used for irrigation and things like that, it's, it's a huge amount more. So the community, and that's why we're serving small communities as well. We have been to a couple of communities where there are not sustainable or working aquifers. And those are somewhere, unfortunately, we have to walk away. If we have to say either the water is not pure enough or the uh, aquifer is not sustainable, we, we, we can't serve that. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Sonid, for sharing such an inspiring project. Thank you. Um, so since you made the decision to become a social entrepreneur, uh, my question is, how did you kickstart this? Like, the first, do you get funding or is it more of a banking? How do you um, kickstart a social um, endeavor or social enterprise? OK, thank you. V very good question. I was, I was very fortunate. Um, that I started this actually as a CSR project within my existing family business. So that really helped us to get a, to get a kickstart. We, we had the engineers in-house who could help us develop some of the technology. Uh, we had teams on the ground in, in Ghana who helped us to execute. And very critically, we, we were given some, let me call it CSR or grant funding from the family business to start this. Um, 
Otherwise, beyond that, because we had proof of concept, we were able to talk to other donors and funders and sponsors uh, along the way. Um, but perhaps it's another conversation for another time because my issue with uh, some impact investors about what they will and won't fund. Um, but it's, it's, it's certainly a challenge and we, we were very fortunate that we had uh, a good kickoff. But what we have found, I will say, once we've proven traction, it's been proven, it was very hard in the beginning as you're a startup that people want to get on board with you. Once you get traction and you can show proof of concept and you show success, then people are quite happy to jump jump on and, uh, and join on board, which is a bit frustrating because it's actually the startups who need a lot, a lot more help. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, really inspiring. Um, I had a similar question about the groundwater, but my next question is, is it a non-profit or a for-profit company now? And I was curious about the logos with, was it Red Crescent and Nestle as well, just had their involvement. Okay, so we, we choose to run ourselves as a not-for-profit, but I, I try not to get involved in these, this terminology because it, if you're an NGO or a not-for-profit or a for-profit or a social enterprise, it, it, it can mean so many things to different people. We run ourselves as a business. We look at getting revenues in, we look at making sure that we have great staff, we make sure that we pay salaries to everyone, we don't rely on volunteers. Um, and we look to make whether you want to call it a profit or a surplus, but we have to make sure that there's sufficient funds there to let us run for the longer term. The reason we're classified as a not-for-profit is that we don't take out any dividends anyway. Even if we were a for-profit, I want to keep all the funds within the organization. Uh, hello. Okay, hello, yes. Uh, as all of them say, the project is really amazing and it could solve a lot of problems and health problems especially. Uh, my question is, is there any future plans or are you willing to make these projects uh, more sustainable by adding uh, water treatment methods? Yes, indeed we are. So in fact, we, the, the, as I mentioned, in order to scale up and to make sure that we could do things efficiently and make sure that the reliability was there for the longer term, we chose at the beginning to make sure that we weren't going to put filtration in. One, because it was a, a cost at, at the beginning, and two, it has an ongoing running cost, and three, it has an ongoing running responsibility. We make sure that Project Margie water is always potable, drinkable, and safe uh, out of the tap. The current filtration systems that we have experimented with, and, and we do mobile monitoring, as I mentioned, so we can measure remotely, is the pump working or not? All current filtration systems need regular maintenance. It's a backwash or the filter needs changing or something like that. That means we're relying on somebody in the village to do that on a regular basis and we can't remotely monitor that. So if somebody doesn't do that or forgets to do it or is late in doing it, we end up serving unclean water. So until we have a viable solution that either can be monitored uh, or doesn't need ongoing changing, we're not yet filtering. But we are experimenting with two sites at the moment. Um, where we are filtering and we think we've got a way around this. But to scale up to reach our goal, we have to have filtration ultimately, but we have to find the right method. Hi. Uh, hi, thank you for the amazing project. I thank like you. the idea that you're running it as a business, which makes it sustainable, not uh, as for the donations. I have one question. You, you've been running it already for five years, mm -hmm. and for the next five years, you said you reach a target of one million. Yes. But how many more millions we are not reaching? That's the question. And why with such great project and the worldwide support that we're hearing, the donations, the corporates, why not more than one million? That's a very good question. Uh, that's what I have to battle with every day. Um, so, so our goal is to double and double and double and double every year. So we go from 50,000 to 100,000 to 200 to 400 to 800. So our goal is to reach a million people by 2025 and 10 million by 2030. 800 million people don't have water in the world. We're focused very much on smaller villages, which will account for probably 30, 40% of that number. But that's, we, we, have, we have two ways to try and address this. One is we work with, what we're trying to build out now is what we call franchise partners. So we're looking to start in Angola, in Ivory Coast, in Mauritania with a model 
which is almost like a franchise partner, will go out with them and they can help us to grow. And also with these other safe water enterprises. There are great organizations like ourselves working in India, in Madagascar, in Haiti, all over the world who have a similar mindset. And together, if we work and we do, we, we met in Mumbai three weeks ago as a group, about 30 of us, and we shared our best practices, we shared our technologies. In fact, we've been looking to start in India. We were looking to deploy a team on our ground there ourselves. Um, but one of these companies is going to partner with us now and we'll be able to expand out there. But you're right, the problem is, is enormous and it needs a lot of collaboration and support and help. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Sunil. Now we'll be stopping for a one hour break and then we'll be back to continue our session. So make sure you're here by two o'clock. So we're going to stop for a half hour and we're going to stop for a half hour and we're going to stop for a half hour. Thank you.